Uh, so again, hey, hey everyone, thanks for uh, joining the new um, BikeLock Academy lecture series session, uh, new start, um, lovely to see so many familiar faces, but um, also some new names here. Um, my name is Laura Pape, I'm a PhD student at the BikeLock Consortium and with me as uh, the second host is uh, Oana Georgiana Rus Oswald, a postdoctoral researcher, uh, so we will be hosting the session today. And the BioClock Consortium is a Dutch uh, research organization. It's set up to study different aspects uh, around, surrounding um, the biological clock in humans, in healthcare, in society, and in 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 nature. Um, so we've set up this um, BioClock Academy lecture series to introduce um, uh, different topics in the field of chronobiology, especially um, for early career researchers, but also just really to anyone that's interested in, in chronobiology. Uh, and so that's why we're here today. Um, we have a time frame of 40 minutes talk and a 15 minute discussion so roughly an hour um uh, yes so if you have any questions during the talk just um put them in the chat so you don't forget or just unmute yourself after the talk and then we can uh, um, have a discussion <laughs> i'll give the floor to uh, uh georgie to introduce our speaker today <laughs> yeah thank you laura uh, also hello from my side welcome everyone um, today we have the pleasure to have among ourselves uh, Dr. Louise Inns. She is a senior scientist at the University of Texas. Uh, so for her is uh, like nine in the morning, uh, not the uh, not the uh, uh, how to say tea time. Uh, she studies the neuroimmunology neuro around the clock, uh, meaning she studies the immune function in the twenty four hour circadian rhythm. Uh, by addressing research questions like why our body's inflammatory response varies depending upon the time of the day and how the dynamics uh, dynamics of neuroimmune responses change with aging and in dementia. Uh, and the broader aim of her research is to identify uh, novel therapeutic targets to help people live better and maybe longer. Uh, but uh, we will give her personally the chance to introduce herself and tell us more about all the exciting things she does Hence, uh, a warm welcome uh, to you, Louise, and good morning, and we're looking forward for your talk. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for the invitation to, to speak in part of this uh, seminar series. It joins a very um, illustrious list of, uh, of people there. I see. Did my screen freeze then? Was that just for me? It was for a second, but I think it's fine now. Okay, cool. Wave at me if it happens again and I can always go back um, and pause. Maybe the time and distance is a little bit too much for the laptop, but we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, so yeah, so as um, Georgiana mentioned, I study how circadian rhythms are regulated by time, uh, how circadian rhythms regulate um, immune responses, um, and also looking a little bit into how um, inflammatory responses might feed back into the circadian system. Um, so like many of us, um, I'm fascinated by these daily rhythms in our physiology um, as we've evolved um, in a rhythmic environment driven by the, um, the Earth's light dark cycle, so too have our biological systems. Um, and in particular, I find the immune system really fascinating as it's a, a critical way that organisms interact with their environment um, and is a really dynamic process and is really crucial for our survival. So as an introduction to immunology, because um, I'm aware that this is more directed at people who are perhaps new to the field, chronobiologists looking at how chronobiology is applied to different research areas. Um, critically, our immune system is crucial for our survival. It helps us fight against pathogens, which we encounter on a daily basis. So viruses, bacteria, parasites um, are all cleared by our immune system. Um, and it can also attack our cells and keep our bodies in check. And generally this is um, a very positive process. So this is clearing damaged or aberrant cells. So fighting against cancer um, and infected cells. And some inflammation is actually a good thing. So in the acute phases that we see um, swelling and pain and redness after um, an injury or like an insect bite, for example, um, this is indicative of the immune system um, trying to fight any potential infections that might occur there. Um, and also serves as a reminder to maybe try and rest and avoid doing whatever it is that you just did again to try and let your body heal. 
However, um, if this persists, um, it shifts into a maladaptive um, immune response. So if this inflammation fails to resolve, for example, um, this pushes us into a state of chronic inflammation. And this is one of the um, hypotheses behind some of the detrimental effects of aging, that there's a, a basal shift in our inflammatory response that predisposes the body to, to respond in a hyperactive way. Um, in addition, the immune system's not infallible. It can certainly be misdirected. Um, and this occurs in the case of allergy, where the body responds to something that is actually relatively innocuous, like pollen is not going to infect us, um, but our body responds as if it's something, um, a very extreme pathogen. Um, and also autoimmunity, where our body attacks ourselves, but in a maladaptive way. So an immune response really needs to be balanced. If it's not active enough, this predisposes us towards infections um, and can allow cancer to progress. Um, but if it's too active, this shifts us into um, an autoimmune state or uh, potentiates allergic reactions. And immune responses can be broad um, or they can be very specific to a pathogen or stimulus um, and they can involve many different immune cell types. So here's a depiction of the two major arms of the immune system. So we have the, um, the innate immune system on the left hand side here, which is more of the rapid response and non-specific um, to a particular pathogen, um, followed by the adaptive response, which is much slower um, to develop, but is in turn very specific to um, a particular um, organism. And many different cell types underlie these processes. So for example, we have cells like granulocytes, which are the first responders of the immune system, release enzymes to kill pathogens and can trap them with extracellular nets. We also have natural killer cells that can kill infected and cancerous cells. Um, and phagocytic cells like macrophages and dendritic cells, which actually physically take up pathogens um, and eat them, and then can present them to the adaptive immune system to say, hey, this is something that you need to respond to. And on the adaptive side, we have cells such as B cells, which make antibodies um, to protect us from further infections. And T cells, of which there are actually many different subsets, but CD8 T cells also kill infected and cancerous cells. And CD4 T cells um, help to coordinate immune responses and also in some cases promote that resolution of inflammation at the end. So there's multiple cell types involved in generating an immune response. And there's also multiple signaling molecules between those cells, as you might imagine, with so many different cells involved. Um, and multiple phases. So we have that initiation where you perceive a stimulus and you get that initial response and um, maintenance so that this pathogen is cleared out um, and hopefully eventually resolution and sometimes tissue remodeling to recover after um, an inflammatory response. So this really requires coordination of all of these functions so that the, the right thing happens at the right time. Um, and as chronobiologists, this might be um, reminiscent of some of the words that you have heard um, previously in some studies. Um, so this is an example from Jürgen Ashoff, one of the grandfathers of the field, um, who said that circadian clocks enable the organism to master the changing conditions in a temporally programmed world, that is to do the right thing at the right time. So this is really directly relevant to um, how immune responses develop and persist. Um, and I personally like to think of it more as a, like an orchestra with the clock as a conductor. So you have all of these different cells that need to come in at the right time. Importantly, they also need to go away at the right time um, and communicate with each other um, to make something that is actually functional and, and beneficial to the organism and not maladaptive. Um, so with this in mind, um, in this seminar, I'll touch briefly um, on some of the history of rhythmic immunology because I feel like actually the knowledge of rhythmic symptoms has been around for a long time. Um, the presence and current areas of research, so some of my own research and some areas that I find particularly cool, so rhythms in immune cell functions, um, time dosing of immunotherapies such as vaccination and antiparasite medication, um, and a little bit on influence of inflammation on circadian rhythms, because I think it's important to remember that this can be a bi-directional process. It's not just circadian regulation of immune function. Um, and also, I'd like to pitch some ideas for the future and the outlook for chronoimmunology, hopefully inspire some of you to um, pursue these research areas or ask some really critical questions um, later on in the talk. 
Um, and a little bit about my own research journey and career path, because I think that's one of the, the really nice things about this seminar series. And I've enjoyed seeing um, from other speakers like how they have got to, to where they are today. So consideration of circadian or at least diurnal regulation of immune function um, has actually been around for, um, well, for centuries, really. Um, it's just not until recently that we really started to understand how time of day exerts its influence. Um, so there's a great historical perspective from Bjorn Lemmer that um, includes references way back um, in circadian immunology. So if you're interested in chronohistory, I really encourage you to, um, to find his article in Chronobiology International. Um, but just two examples, I think. Um, so the Roman physician Caelius Aurelianus actually lived in the 5th century. He just took a very long time to be published. Um, and he describes here um, symptoms of what we would know as nocturnal asthma. So that heavy breath and wheeze called asthma by the Greeks um, critically occurs um, during the winter and at night more than during the day and in the spring. So even back in the fifth century or um, in the 18th century um, being published, he reported this time of day difference and actually a seasonal difference as well. Um, and also the idea of chronomedicine, so giving um, therapeutics at different times of day is also not actually necessarily very new. Um, back in the 1800s, Julian Joseph Ferre also stated um, that all medicines are not equally indicated effective given at different hours of the day. So the time at which you give a drug um, can also modulate its effects. Um, and the immune system is, is no exception to this. There's some really great work looking at time dosing there. Um, so rhythms in physiology and medicine have really been recognized for centuries. Um, but one of the kind of landmark papers in the field, I would say, came from Franz Halberg um, in 1960, uh, looking at time of day as a regulator of inflammatory response to a bacterial endotoxin. And um, so here um, he took different cohorts of mice, gave them the same dose of a bacterial toxin. So LPS is a lipopolysaccharide, is a component of the bacterial cell wall um, and elicits a really robust inflammatory response, but doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't further divide, it doesn't propagate. And so here, giving different cohorts of mice um, this drug at different times of day, and one week later measured um, the percent death so when this um, toxin was given at 4 p.m., around about 85% of that cohort died. That very same dose, that very same compound, um, at midnight, about 85% of them survived. So this is a really significant difference. Um, the only thing that has changed is the time. And these two lines actually represent two independent studies of this. So it was um, certainly reproducible um, in his lab. So the conclusion from this is that this LPS was much more potent in the light phase or the resting phase of these nocturnal rodents. Um, and indeed, mice were five times more likely to die if they were injected at that time point. So I think sometimes we can think of rhythms like very conceptually, and this is um, genuinely very interesting. Um, but in some cases, this can really be a life or death scenario. You know, this is a real significant impact on physiology. Um, so with this in mind, I'd really like to cover a few current areas um, of chronoimmunology research that come off the back of, of Halberg and all of those um, historical notes of time symptoms. And I think that's one of the things that really fascinates me about chronoimmunology, that there's such a diversity in the field. You can really choose your adventure to some degree. There's so many different things that are trying to infect us um, and so many different cells involved in protecting us. And um, you can kind of pick your favorite um, and study that in a rhythmic manner, which is great. Um, so I'll bring you back to the examples of some of the different cell types are involved. Um, but really, well, the point I want to make with this figure is just that these are all cells that have been investigated in the context of a circadian clock. So looking at molecular oscillators um, or timers within each of these cells has been studied. And um, so there's now a real wealth of literature looking at um, immunity in a rhythmic manner. And just as a reminder, um, in case you're not familiar with the molecular underpinnings of a circadian rhythm, and um, what we mean when we say we've studied the molecular clock in these cells um, is looking at this core transcription translation feedback loop um, that drives the 24 hour clock within cells. And um, so fundamentally, we have transcription factor BMAL1 that binds to clock, um, or in some cases, NPAS2. 
um, binds to the promoter region in DNA sequences and promotes transcription um, of downstream gene regulators. So periods and cryptochromes are transcribed, heterodimerize um, as proteins, and translocate back to the nucleus to suppress the activity um, of BMR1 and clock. And this generates that 24-hour um, feedback loop. And in addition, we have promotion of um, reverbs and ROARs, which also compete for binding sites called raw sites in a variety of different genes, including BMAL1, um, but also some um, inflammatory genes as well. So the clock is really linked to the immune system at a, a fundamental molecular process as well. Um, and the clock has been studied in uh, multiple different immune cell types as depicted here. I'm just going to pick a couple of them um, to discuss today. Um, and I think probably one of the best studied um, cells is the macrophage with respect to circadian rhythms. And that's one of the cells that I started with um, actually as a master's student in the Loudon lab. Um, so macrophages uh, literally means big eaters, those, those phagocytic cells that take up pathogens um, and can either present them to the adaptive immune response or can simply destroy them within themselves. Um, and they show time of day responses to inflammatory stimuli. So here again, mice were injected with that bacterial endotoxin, LPS. Um, and here the blood was analyzed for inflammatory proteins um, a few hours later. So interleukin-6 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine um, that elicits further inflammatory responses. And we see that a stimulus given at CT0 elicits a lower response than that same stimulus at CT12. Um, and here I'll do a little aside because I know that the nomenclature can be a little off-putting for certainly people who are new to the field. You may or may not be familiar with Zeitgeber time, which is ZT. Um, and this is depicted with when we have a timing signal such as light, ZT0 is the time of lights on. And in a 12-12 light dark cycle, ZT12 is when those lights go off. Um, some experiments in the circadian field, and certainly in the immunology field, are done in constant conditions. So this we use circadian time, so CT, um, but they're approximately equivalent. Um, it's just that we don't have that light-dark cycle anymore. So in the absence of these external timing signals, um, we're really getting into the, the intrinsic clock here. We don't have that light-dark cycle kind of giving that cue. This is all coming from the organism. So CT0 is when the time the lights would have come on, but they're in constant darkness, the start of their subjective resting phase. And CT12 is when the lights would have gone off um, and the start of the rodent's active phase. So here, this is in constant conditions. And at the start of the rodent's active phase, that's when we see the peak of the inflammatory response. Um, and one of the great things about macrophages is you can manipulate them quite um, quite easily um, and you can culture them and stimulate them ex vivo as well. Um, but when we um, disrupt the clock in those macrophages, so here we have a BMAL1 um, knockout specific to macrophages um, and isolate them at different times of day and quantify clock gene expression with qPCR. Um, hopefully what you see here in the black line is control um, cells show these really nice rhythms in those different um, genes uh, associated with the biological clock. Um, but if you knock out BMR1, that critical like central component, um, all of these rhythms are abolished and they're flattened at different levels depending on like the, the phasing of the clock. And what happens when you do that same inflammatory challenge in rodents that have BMR1 um, disrupted in their macrophage is that this time of day effect is abolished. And it actually seems to potentiate the inflammatory response a little so that it's elevated, um, certainly at CT0. So disruption of the clock in macrophages exacerbates inflammation. Um, and this is not specific to macrophages. Um, multiple groups have studied different immune cells and modulating them um, in a genetic manner. Um, so these are kind of the first responders in the body, um, but the brain is actually not um, immune to this either. Um, so brain resident immune cells called microglia also show time of day responses to inflammatory stimuli. Um, and this is one of the cell types that we work with uh, in the Funken lab. Um, so here, microglia are isolated at different times of day, cultured in vitro and given um, that bacterial toxin LPS um, 
in cell culture. And again, we qPCR for inflammatory gene expression. So here is interleukin one beta, another pro-inflammatory um, cytokine. And we see during the resting phase, this nice dose response curve. So more LPS elicits a greater inflammatory response. Um, but this is actually really suppressed in the active phase of rodents. So depending on the time that you're um, taking these cells and stimulating them, you can really get um, very different inflammatory responses there. Um, so microglia show increased inflammatory responses during the resting phase. So it seems like in brain and in body, we have this dynamic regulation of inflammation. So the previous examples are um, both tissue resident immune cells, but actually the immune system is very dynamic um, and many immune cells move around the body um, as a form of immunosurveillance. And actually what happens is our organs will perceive that, um, that threat, that pathogen, um, and send off um, cytokines and signals to recruit immune cells to their location. Um, and one of the projects that I was involved with um, as a graduate student was looking at how um, time of day influences the response response to an inhaled um, challenge. So mice which inhale that bacterial toxin at different times of day, um, and then had lungs analyzed for infiltrating immune cells. So the lung sends out this signal um, of danger and damage and in immune cells infiltrate in. And what happens here in um, BML1, BML1 flux flux, so control um, wild type animals, um, we see more immune cells infiltrating at that CT0 time point than at CT12. Um, but critically, if you then disrupt the clock within the lung, this is massively potentiated. Um, so disruption of the clock in the lung cells themselves um, disrupts what signals are being sent to the immune system and recruits additional immune cells into that tissue. And this is not necessarily um, a productive response. And this is simply quantified here. So we have lower inflammation um, down here and increased inflammation with more neutrophils being um, recruited to the lung. Um, so a, a subtle time of day difference in the wild types, but this is um, greatly potentiated uh, if the clock is disrupted in the lung. And um, so we get exacerbated immune cell influx if the clock is disrupted. And these examples have been focused on um, relatively short-term um, inflammatory responses. Uh, so in the period of kind of two to six hours, let's say, um, you will get this um, rapid influx of immune cells and increase in cytokine expression. Um, but when I came to the end of my, uh, my PhD program, I was interested to see, does this actually map onto longer term immune responses? So I mentioned that the adaptive immune system takes much longer to develop. That's more in the period of, of weeks to months. Um, as we know with, um, with vaccinations, it takes us a while to be fully protected following that. Um, are they still regulated by time of day, something that takes multiple days to develop? Um, surely this kind of evens out, right? Um, but that seems to not be the case. These are still imprinted depending on the time of that initial stimulus. Um, so using a model of um, vaccination, I moved into my postdoctoral work, really assessing different stages of a vaccination response and how this might be regulated by time of day. So one of the earliest processes in a vaccination response um, is immune cell migration to the lymph node and um, following perception of that stimulus. Um, so what happens is we have these um, dendritic cells in the skin um, performing immunosurveillant functions. And then when they sense a stimulus, and this could be a pathogen, this could be the vaccine that is given, um, these cells are stimulated to migrate. So they migrate into lymphatic vessels in the skin um, and they move downstream to the lymph node. Um, and that's really the area that facilitates communication with those other adaptive immune cells. And um, so when you get sick and you feel like the swelling perhaps like in the, in the neck, um, that's your lymph nodes really filling with cells and facilitating that um, cell communication. And um, so looking at different stages with this, um, we had an assay um, in the Scheinman lab looking at cell migration uh, into ear skin. And this was driven by one of the graduate students in the lab, Stefan Holtkamp. Um, but what we did with, with his experiments was isolating ear skin at different times of day. Um, so during the resting phase and during the active phase, and you can split the skin to expose the, the inner side um, of the tissue and apply cells that we had cultured um, in vitro. 
It's the exact same population of immune cells. The only thing that is different is the timing of the, the ear tissue. Um, and if we take um, videos of this, hopefully this works. Yes. Um, so the immune cells here are labeled um, in green um, and the vessels are labeled in red. So these, the larger vessels that you see here that are kind of like more blunt ended um, are lymphatic vessels. And those immune cells will crawl into those vessels and then be taken to the lymph node. Um, and if we do this a, a second time of day, so during the active phase, um, these cells, despite being the exact same batch applied um, at a similar time, um, and much more sluggish to migrate into those, those vessels. And we can quantify this um, at the end of the assay, uh, looking at how many cells are inside the vessels um, versus outside. So here we have more cells inside the vessel if the ear was taken during the resting phase than if the ear was taken during the active phase. So this indicates that um, immune cell migration into the lymphatics is more potentiated during that resting phase. It's easier for those cells to get in um, and potentially migrate to the lymph node. So yeah, Stefan looked at um, a really, um, really characteristic um, flow of how immune cells migrate into the lymphatics um, and is a really um, great resource paper for people interested in um, specifically the immune cell migration aspect. Um, but one of the things that I was more interested in was um, how does that actually affect communication in the lymph node and how does that affect um, a, a vaccination response model? And um, so for that, we really had to turn in vivo to look at a whole organism um, more holistically. Um, so the in vivo um, equivalent of this really is to perform something called FITSI painting. And with this, you apply this topical and um, fluorescent molecule um, again, to the ear skin at different times of day. Um, and you can monitor how immune cells migrate to the draining lymph node. So if you paint the ear, it drains to the, um, the lymph nodes in the neck. And if you take that at different time points following that um, stimulation, you see a gradual expansion of the lymph node as more cells accumulate there. Um, but this is also uh, modulated by time of day. So here in the pale blue, this is stimulation during the resting phase. And in the dark blue, is stimulation during the active phase. And we see um, a greatly enhanced um, expansion if this stimulus is given during the resting phase. Um, and this is linked to expression of a specific molecule called ICAM-1, which uh, facilitates immune cell infiltration, so from the blood into the tissues. Um, and this is, again, greatly increased if the stimulus is given during the resting phase. So these two, um, two sides of the same coin, really. We have the, the number of cells increasing and the expression of this pro-migratory molecule increasing, and um, which in turn facilitates more cells being able to enter the lymph node at this time. Um, and we hypothesize that this um, differential recruitment of immune cells um, from the circulation um, would lead to differences um, in the efficacy of, um, of a protective response further down the line. And one of the ways that we can test that um, is with, with a real vaccine. Um, so at the time, um, this was really the vaccine development for, for SARS-CoV-2, for the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and you can make um, a non-commercial version of this um, with just the spike peptide, so the same thing that, that humans were vaccinated with. Um, and you can administer it to mice during, again, the resting phase or the active phase. Um, but critically with this experiment, what we could then do um, was take cells from tissues, um, such as the spleen, um, and re-stimulate with that same antigen. So this is now assessing like the memory response. So has this led to a greater um, memory for this, this pathogen and a greater response? In this case, a whole month later. And what we see here again, um, looking here at the production of um, a survival factor interleukin-2 in the T cells, um, that we see a greater response if that vaccine was given during the resting phase than if that vaccine was given during the active phase. And this is for those CD4 T cells, so um, the immune cells that help to coordinate the immune response. Um, but also for those CD8 T cells, the more direct responders um, that would be um, killing infected cells um, in the body. So we see that vaccination during the resting phase um, elicits a greater response. And I probably should have put here 
in mice um, because this study was um, basic science looking at um, the response in mice. But actually, um, we were really interested in like how clinically relevant this is. Does this also confer better protection in people? Um, at a similar time, um, Jeff Haspel's lab at WashU um, was looking at um, a longitudinal study of people who had been vaccinated against COVID-19. So here um, they stratified data from patients that were um, vaccinated during the morning, so 8 a.m. till midday, um, in the early afternoon, so midday till about 4 p.m., um, and then the late afternoon, early evening, 4 till 9 p.m., uh, 4 till 8 p.m., sorry. And this figure is really depicting how many people remain COVID free. So at the start of the experiment, 100% of people in this vaccination study had not, um, had not had COVID. Um, so the further it stays up on this axis, the more effective that vaccine is. And we see that it's sustained for a little while. These people um, are relatively um, protected from COVID. Um, but then the Delta variant hits um, and we see a, a sudden drop in how many people remain COVID free. Um, and this gradient is different depending on when those people had that vaccine. So people who had the vaccine during the early morning in the blue line um, stay higher up. So a greater percentage of them remain COVID free compared to certainly um, the red line, which is those who had it in the evening. And then it kind of plateaus for a bit um, as the population clears out. Um, but then the Omicron variant hits and again, we see that big drop and that difference is really maintained. So people who had their vaccine in the morning um, remain better protected than those who had it in the early evening. Um, and this like the, the time period of this whole experiment is about a year and a half. Um, so it's really interesting to see that in a, a real world scenario and a real population um, the vaccination timing um, certainly for COVID-19 for this formulation um, was much better when given earlier during the day. And I think there's a lot of attention now looking at how we can optimize this to, to promote the best, um, the best efficacy for vaccines. So vaccination was just one example of how, um, how this can be regulated by time of day and how timing can be used to boost treatment efficacy. Um, it really has its background and foundation in the knowledge of that toxin-induced mortality that Holberg um, reported um, being higher in the resting phase for, for rodents. Um, and the knowledge that production of inflammatory molecules is rhythmic. Um, and this does depend on the cells and the location. So there's subtly different rhythms between macrophages, between microglia, between um, stromal cells. Um, so there's there's much more um, nuance, perhaps, um, than just saying, like, yes, rest phase is, is highly um, pro-inflammatory. And the knowledge that cell migration also differs according to time of day. Um, this is more efficient during the rest phase for dendritic cells into the lymphatics. Um, but how does this relate to other diseases and their symptoms? And how does this relate to, to medication timing for, for other, um, other pathologies? And there's a lot of attention now really turning to, to this chronomedicine um, and chronopathology, um, which is really great to see. So one of the um, one of the areas that I think is really cool um, from a chronobiology perspective and an immunology perspective um, is looking at rhythms in um, parasites and in hosts. So organisms that can survive um, also outside of us um, and have their own um, clocks and rhythms. Um, so for example, um, Trypanosoma brucei is um, an extracellular parasite. It lives in the bloodstream. Um, and then invades the central nervous system. Um, and this is the, the underlying cause for sleeping sickness, which is um, an incredibly nasty disease, uh, causes delirium, seizures, and characteristic sleep-wake disturbances. Um, and if untreated, is is essentially fatal. It's um, a very, very nasty disease. Um, current therapies also have quite severe side effects. Um, so renal failure is relatively common in this, anaphylaxis hallucinations. So the treatment is also very unpleasant. Um, and fundamentally, there's, there's really a global need for more effective therapies, um, certainly against parasitic infections and relatively neglected tropical diseases. Um, I think the CDC is also turning its attention um, towards some of these diseases as well. 
Um, and as a chronobiologist, um, one of the things that is super interesting is that these organisms also have circadian rhythms. And so this is work from Philippa Rijo Ferrero when she was in Joe Takahashi's lab. Um, and she now has her own lab um, over at UC Berkeley. And she grew the parasite in a dish and measured rhythms. So took um, samples at different times of day um, and performed sequencing experiments. Uh, and she found oscillations in gene expression, both in temperature cycling, so in um, a diurnal model, um, but also in those constant conditions, so a bona fide circadian oscillation. Um, and that many genes were um, related to metabolism um, in this parasite. And critically, um, she also asked the question, is treatment sensitivity rhythmic? Um, can we use um, timing information to optimize how we treat um, this parasite? Um, so this, uh, this figure shows the time of day along the x-axis um, and essentially how much drug is needed to kill that parasite along the y. So less drug needed down here, more drug needed up here. And you see this really beautiful distribution um, that the, the amount of drug depends on the time. And quantifying this, she found that you actually need two and a half times more drug if you're trying to dose at the time of peak resistance um, than if you dose at the timing of peak sensitivity. I mean, it's a relatively subtle window, like it's not necessarily 12 hours apart. Um, and that's where really, um, really getting into the, the bones of um, these rhythms can be very beneficial. So in this model, dosing at the right time can therefore increase therapeutic index and hopefully mitigate side effects. Because if you can give half the amount of drug and still have the same efficacy on the parasite, then you're going to minimize the effects on your own cells um, and hopefully um, lead to a, a more effective therapy. And so far, I've discussed um, chronoimmunology in one direction, so timing influencing um, the immune response um, or the response to, um, to treatment. Um, but one of, the, um, one of the really cool things is influences of immune activation or of infection on the circadian clock as well. This occurs um, in the opposite direction too. Um, and a really elegant example of this came from Rachel Edgar, um, who also has her own lab now. I think she's at Imperial. Um, and she looked at um, viral exploitation of the circadian clock. Um, so infection of um, different cells at different times of day um, and how this influenced the circadian rhythm. And one of the first experiments she did was just to um, infect at different times of day and see how this influenced viral replication. And um, so here this is um, it's actually a fluorescent virus or luminescent virus. Um, so you can measure the radiance being emitted. Um, so more viral replication, more luminescence um, and greater um, infection capacity. So here she showed infection at that timing of lights on, that ZT0, um, was much stronger than timing um, the infection at ZT10, so just at the start of the, um, the active phase. Um, but critically, she then linked that to um, the clock and the molecular clockwork. So she discovered that infection with this um, herpes virus actually led to induction of expression of BMAL1, that, that core clock um, gene and protein. So this is BMAL1 um, luminescence oscillating about zero. So more BMAL1, less BMAL1, more BMAL1, less BMAL1. Um, and this oscillates um, endogenously um, in cells. But when she infects them, she gets um, an induction of BMAL1 around about six hours um, after the infection. And if this occurs at the timing that BMAL1 would normally be increasing, you get this really nice um, uh, exacerbation or um, increase in amplitude oscillation. It synergizes with the endogenous rhythm. Um, but if you do that when BMAL1 is naturally decreasing, um, you then get this disruption of the circadian rhythm. So BMAL1 was going down in this black line, but this induction in the red um, then disrupts um, the rhythm. And this potentiates um, viral replication um, by way of disrupting the clock. So there's some really interesting work, I think, going on uh, looking at how um, different infections and different um, inflammatory stimuli can also feed back to the clock, potentially propagate clock disruption, which then allows these pathogens to further, um, further replicate. 
Um, and my goal in discussing all of these studies, um, I'm aware that it's a lot and it's a lot of variety, but my goal was really to, to introduce um, the different areas and hot topics for research currently in the field um, and hopefully inspire some of you to um, ask your own questions about some of these um, and to think about how this might be um, developed in the future. Um, so I also want to spend some time looking at um, where I think the field is going and I think some prospects for, for future work and some cool work that is um, in the pipeline. So I think one of the um, areas that's got um, growing attention, which is absolutely fantastic, is integrating circadian biology into the clinical setting. Um, I know this is one of the um, priorities for the BioClock Consortium as well. There's some super work looking at um, clinical um, chronobiology. So things like looking at the exact timing of tests and treatments um, for precision medicine. This is also great for us as basic scientists, because if we can get everything time stamped, then it allows us to really probe some of that, that clinical data um, much more efficiently um, and to see how we can um, develop hypotheses and test it in our models to look at how timing um, influences, influences treatment efficacy. And um, things like optimizing environments for recovery. So shown here is um, a diurnal lighting scheme um, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And um, so really trying to minimize things that disrupt the circadian clock um, to try and promote recovery. So lower levels of light at night, shifting um, the hue of light as well can be beneficial. Um, timing of food intake um, and therapies as well, because um, for a significant number of hospital admissions, inflammation is a component of this as well. And um, so I think this is a really key area for chronoimmunologists. Um, and one thing that I'm really curious about is the predictive value of rhythmic data. So a lot of us have wearables and trackables. Um, if there's data that can be used from this that might be useful for things like predicting flare-ups of inflammatory diseases um, or seeing how these rhythms change, for example, with age um, and whether this is um, indicative of a predisposition to inflammatory disorders later in life. Um, another area that is super cool is manipulating rhythms to mitigate inflammation. So if you do have that knowledge that your rhythms are becoming disrupted, um, what can you do about that? Um, so there's significant groups of society that do exhibit circadian disruption and misalignment. Um, I know Emily talked a little bit about that with shift workers um, in her talk, um, but in the aging context and in jet lag as well, this transient misalignment um, can have significant implications for um, pathology. And so here there's um, inflammation is listed as just one, but I would really like to point out that obesity has an inflammatory component, aging and altered wound healing has an inflammatory component, and psychiatric disorders and neurodegenerative diseases have inflammatory components. So um, there's really a lot of areas that this, this is applicable to. Um, and one of the things that I'm looking at currently is how, um, how we can use feeding rhythms and perhaps exercise strategies um, to reduce neuroinflammatory pathology in a disruption scenario. Um, a third one that I think is super cool and I alluded to earlier is contributions of different clocks. And um, for example, pathogen versus host um, and rhythms in microbiota um, is a, a very, very hot area. So we have all of these organisms living within us on a daily basis um, and their biology changes according to time of day. How does that influence our immune response? And so we have things like the parasite with its own rhythms, the host with its own rhythms, how they interact. Um, but then things get really complicated if you think about things that have a vector or an intermediate host. So the tsetse fly or the malaria parasite lives in mosquitoes. Mosquitoes have their own rhythms that are also modulated by human behavioral rhythms. And then on top of that, we have those abiotic rhythms. So light dark has definitely been very well studied. Um, but what about the role of temperature and humidity and additional environmental rhythms? And um, so this then starts to get more into ecology um, and things that are um, integrating different aspects of, um, of global um, environments. And finally, I think we should also not forget that circadian is not the only time scale that we work under. Um, I think coronabiology is definitely 
um, perhaps mostly focused on circadian rhythms, um, but they're layered with longer and shorter term rhythms that also drive physiological processes. And um, so seasonal and circannual rhythms, how do things like hibernation um, or torpor, those changes in metabolism um, impact immune function? Um, and shorter rhythms like ultradian and circulunar rhythms, um, how do they regulate immune processes? And ultimately also development and degradation. So on a longer um, time scale, not an oscillatory perhaps, um, but when do these immune rhythms develop? How do they degrade? How can we prevent them from degrading? And um, so that really ends most of the scientific part of that. Hopefully I've kind of planted some seeds of, of questions for you um, for the future and for the next um, few minutes to discuss. Um, but I was also asked to include a little bit about my career path. And as I said, I found this really interesting for other people to see and um, how they got to where they are. Um, and is um, something that I've not been asked to include before. So it's actually quite nice. And um, so yeah, how did how did I get here? Um, so I didn't start out as an immunologist. Um, I started out as a neuroscientist um, and I took a chronobiology unit with Andrew Loudon in my final year of undergrad. Um, and that really hooked me on daily rhythms in physiology. Um, and I thought that that was super cool. Um, and how does this influence our immune system? Um, I graduated in 2015. Um, and at the time I decided to just do like, let's just do everything together. So I defended my thesis. I got married um, and then I moved and took a postdoc um, in Germany. Um, and that really came about because, um, as I said, I was really interested in how um, immune systems on a longer time scale are regulated by the circadian clock. Um, and Christoph Scheiman was doing some really great work on immune migration um, and adaptive immune responses. So I moved to Germany, uh, investigated adaptive immunity. Um, as part of that project, um, the lab moved to Switzerland and um, so continued that project, had another international move. A um, particular highlight here was getting to visit CERN. Um, so every now and again, they like shut down the whole site and you can go into the Large Hadron Collider, which is fantastic. Um, and then at the end of that project, um, I was really interested in how does that then feed back to those neuroscience um, underpinnings? Because when we get sick, we also exhibit some really characteristic behaviors like social withdrawal. Um, and then looking at ways that I can integrate immune function with um, behavior. So then I moved to uh, UT to work with Laura Fonken, who is a behavioral neuroimmunologist and circadian endocrinologist, uh, looking at uh, rhythms in neuroimmune function. Um, and then most recently, uh, I had a baby last year and I'm embarking on the faculty job search. So if anyone um, wants a circadian immunologist in their department, please let me know. If you want to work with me, also let me know. Um, so yeah, so this is how I got to where I am today um, and continue to be fascinated by, by rhythmic immunology. So hopefully I've convinced you and that you'll all agree that corona immunology has a, a rich history and an exciting future. Um, timing has an impact on immune responses, but immune activation can also interact with timing mechanisms. Um, and corona immunology has a really strong translational relevance and clinical potential um, with lots of exciting questions to pursue. And with that, I would just like to thank um, mentors past and present um, and the lab. So current members of the Funken lab in particular, um, Laura is a super mentor. And um, my current undergrads are Konksha, Alecki and Sophia. And um, my previous undergrads, Christian and Anusha did fantastic work with me in the lab. Um, all of the funders past and present um, and also mentors for, for continuing to support and inspire um, and for getting me hooked on such a, a fascinating field. Um, and I will happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Louisa. Amazing. Uh, you, you brought your excitement into the talk because you managed to keep us uh, focused uh, in our uh, afternoon time. Uh, very, very great talk. Thank you very much.